So I wanna address this question, will there be a foreclosure crisis in 2021? Now the KCM research team has done a lot of work in this area. It's come up in a number of different uh, forums, whether it's a Facebook group uh, with, with agents in it, whether it's YouTube and experts out there are talking about it, whether it's a broker that's you know saying, hey, my agents are asking, when are all the REO properties going to come to market? Um, it's a topic being talked about in our industry, and it's one that when you ask people, certainly uh, elicits an emotion and a response. Some people saying, uh, no, I don't believe there will be. Some people absolutely convinced uh, there will be one. So I wanna take just a couple of minutes in advance of us doing a deep dive on this. If you're a KCM member, we're gonna go deep and go through a lot of data, a lot of information, but I wanna give you just a couple of things before we do that to help you think about that. Now, now let me position this uh, in this way. If you've seen a YouTube video and somebody out there talking about a foreclosure crisis, I, I wanna say that um, you know a lot of those, not to discount every one of them, um, but a lot of those are selling a way out of it. And so you need to look at that and say, okay, is this person creating a scenario here that they ultimately have the solution for and you know would benefit from? That's the first point. The second point is, they may talk about a doomsday scenario that if this were to happen, this were to happen, this were to happen, and this were to happen, then we would be in a situation, and, and so, you know, a foreclosure situation. And so I would say to that, yeah, if all those things did happen in a row, while not likely, uh, then we would be. But let's look at what we can tell right now from data, from the insights we can draw from that data uh, to get that information. So. First, I wanna bring in is a quote from Aspen Grove Solutions, and, and, and I'll read it here. It says, unlike 2008, strategic defaults have not emerged as a serious problem and seem unlikely to emerge. So to this point, they have not emerged as a serious problem. They go on to say, given stronger expectations for property price increases, a record low inventory of homes and stable residential uh, underlighting standards leading up to the crisis, which has reduced the number of owners who are underwater. Underwater is not a term that we've uh, talked about in quite some time. You know, coming out of the housing crash when people literally owed more on their home than it was worth, and they, they then walked, they were underwater. Um, we, we had a, a, a certainly a foreclosure crisis back then. But let's go look at a couple of things. Now, if you've been following KCM, you're, you're well versed in this, but if we look at projections for home price appreciation going forward, we see everything from Zillow here to CoreLogic. Zillow on one side at 7% CoreLogic on the very end, which I don't agree with at 0.2%, but most being in the middle there, around four or 5% appreciation. So healthy appreciation going forward, uh, in in uh, home prices. So why is this important? Well, the we've talked extensively at KCM about the amount of equity that people have across the country, how people have used their equity since the housing crisis in different ways, not tapping into it, not, not being extravagant with it, pulling it out and going on vacations. They've used their equity wisely and not tapped it. Now, as prices appreciate, they add to that equity, giving them options during this crisis. So that's the first reason. Go back to what uh, you know, Aspen Grove Solutions said. First one was, hey, prices are projected to rise. We're in a good market there. The second thing they said, let's look at this, the months of inventory on the market. Now we know the, the latest numbers, we're at a record low amount of inventory in this country, and that has been the challenge. Ultimately, the challenge that could hold the real estate market back in you know, further growth. So across the country in September, we ended up with 2.7 months on average uh, of inventory, and certainly by market, by price point, that's gonna vary. And even as we sit today, likely lower than that going into the winter months. But we know with a lack of inventory, there have been increased bidding wars. There have been increased demand uh, for homes with low interest rates as well, I would add to that, you know, driving that inventory down. And quickly as you know, we can bring homes to market, they're being bought even sometimes quicker than we can bring them to market. So very positive for someone that may be in a situation that has to sell, you know, has to go into um, uh, you know, a different situation because they can no longer, they didn't get their job back, they can't afford their home, and that happens in our business. We certainly don't wish it upon anyone, but uh, as that happens, there are options for these people that they you know, didn't have back in the housing crash when they oftentimes owed more uh, than what it was worth and they just walked away. 
The third thing they say is the, um, uh, you know, the lending standards that uh, have been in the business since the housing crash. Now, what I'm gonna show up here is um, default risk in the mortgage market. There are two components to default, default risk. The product risk, so think about that, the type of mortgage, if you remember back in the housing crash, a NEGAM or a pick a pay or all the different products that were out there. And then there's borrower risk, even some of the products that would say, okay, how much do you make borrower? Or do you just tell us that? And you know, it's a stated income loan, those aren't, in the market today. So what's happened since then? Two things have happened. Product risk has fallen off of the, the, the table there. There's not a lot of product risk as measured by the Urban Institute. Also, borrower risk has gone down. Think about that in lending standards. You know, lending standards have gotten tighter since the housing crash. So, you know, when we hear somebody say, okay, we're not in a situation like that because of the standards in lending, they're absolutely right. By product, by borrower, those standards have changed since then. You know, if we look at a reasonable lending standard, we've got that highlighted on the slide, a reasonable market would have a little bit of product risk, a little bit of borrower risk, and that's ultimately how the, the market moves forward. But we, we're in a market where there's very little product risk based on what's being put out into the market and lending standards for borrowers have gotten uh, a lot tighter. And, and so I think when we look at those three things, prices, inventory, lending standards, they start to position us to say, okay, like, like what, what Aspen Grove Solutions said, this strategic default area has not shown itself uh, in, uh, in this so far. So the question is what's gonna happen going forward? And that's what we're gonna tackle when we go deeper on this at, at Keeping Current Matters. But, but I'll end with this quote. It's from Rick Sharga at Realty Track. Now Realty Track, you, you know, does a lot of their business in foreclosures and this is what they know. It's how they make their money. And they say this, we'll certainly see more repossessions by lenders once the foreclosure moratoria have ended. So there's been a foreclosure moratorium this year uh, due to forbearance saying you cannot start judicial or non-judicial foreclosure as we get through this crisis. But he goes on to say, uh, but maybe not as many as people might expect. Given the record amount of homeowner equity, it seems likely that many homeowners in financial distress will opt to take advantage of strong demand among home buyers and sell their property rather than risking uh, losing it to foreclosure auction. So that gives you just a little bit of information, a little bit of data around what's happening in the market relative to this question.